Welcome to our series exploring the enigmatic realm of unexplained deaths and mysteries. Join us as we delve into perplexing cases that defy conventional understanding, where each clue raises more questions. From baffling disappearances to puzzling crime scenes, prepare to uncover the secrets behind these haunting mysteries. Let me tell you about one of Hollywood's enduring mysteries, the tragic death of Natalie Wood, one of the most beloved actresses of her time. In 1981, Wood was working on the film Brainstorm with actor Christopher Walken. She and her husband, Robert Wagner, invited Walken to join them for a weekend trip on their yacht, The Splendor, off the coast of Catalina Island. According to Dennis Davern, the yacht's captain, tensions were high between Wood and Wagner. Apparently, Wood had developed an infatuation with Walken, which added to the strain. On the evening of November 28th, Wood and Walken went ashore to have drinks at a local bar. Witnesses recall Wood appearing visibly intoxicated and unsteady on her feet as she left the restaurant, having eaten very little. Later that night, they returned to the yacht. Witnesses from a nearby boat reported hearing a woman screams for help around midnight. Wagner claimed that he and Walken had a heated but non-violent argument that night, and Wood had gone to bed. It wasn't until around 1.30 a.m., when Wagner went to kiss her goodnight, that he realized she was missing. Tragically, Wood's body was discovered about six hours later, approximately a mile from the yacht. She was wearing a flannel nightgown, blue wool socks, and a red down jacket. The Los Angeles County Coroner, Thomas Noguchi, ruled her death an accidental drowning compounded by hypothermia. However, Wood's sister, Lana, raised serious doubts about this ruling. She argued that Wood, who had a lifelong fear of water and could not swim, would never have voluntarily left the yacht. In the years since, the mystery surrounding Natalie Wood's death has persisted. New witnesses and evidence have occasionally surfaced, leading to reopened investigations and renewed media interest. Despite this, definitive answers remain elusive, and her death continues to captivate and mystify. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. James Riddle Jimmy Hoffa was a towering figure in the American labor movement, particularly as the president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters from 1958 to 1971. During his leadership, Hoffa transformed the Teamsters into the most powerful labor union in the United States, controlling over 90% of the nation's transportation industry. This immense influence allowed the Teamsters to negotiate better wages, benefits, and working conditions for their members. Hoffa's tenure was marked by his aggressive tactics and controversial methods. He wasn't shy about using his connections to the Mafia to achieve his goals. One of the most notable instances of this was in 1941 during a turf war in Detroit. Hoffa hired Mafia members to eliminate his rivals, consolidating his power within the Union. This relationship with organized crime was mutually advantageous. The Mafia benefited from access to the Teamsters' pension fund, using the money to finance Las Vegas casinos and other ventures, while Hoffa secured favorable returns on these loans for the pension fund. Despite his notorious associations, Hoffa was beloved by many Teamsters members. He was seen as a champion of the working class, fiercely advocating for higher wages and better benefits. His ability to deliver tangible improvements in the lives of his members earned him widespread support, even as his ties to the Mafia raised eyebrows and attracted scrutiny. Hoffa's downfall began in 1967 when he was convicted of bribery, jury tampering, and mail fraud. These charges stemmed from his efforts to manipulate a federal jury. Sentenced to 13 years in prison, Hoffa's influence seemed to wane. However, his ambitions never dimmed. When he was released from prison in 1971, it was under the condition that he would refrain from any union activities until 1980, a stipulation designed to keep him out of the labor movement's affairs. The most dramatic chapter of Hoffa's life came on July 30, 1975, 
On that day Hoffa was last seen at the Machus Red Fox restaurant in Bloomfield Township, a suburb of Detroit. He was scheduled to meet Anthony Tony Jack Giacalone and Anthony Tony Pro Provenzano, both high-ranking mafia members with whom Hoffa had a complicated and tense relationship. Giacalone was a well-known Detroit mafia captain, and Provenzano, a Teamster official and mafia associate, had a notoriously volatile relationship with Hoffa. Hoffa's disappearance was swift and mysterious. Witnesses reported seeing him waiting in the restaurant parking lot, but he was never seen again. His car was found in the restaurant's lot, but there was no sign of Hoffa. Various theories have been proposed, including that he was murdered and his body disposed of in a manner that would prevent its discovery, such as being buried under concrete or incinerated. The investigation into Hoffa's disappearance remains one of the most enduring mysteries in American history. Over the years, numerous individuals have claimed to have knowledge of his final resting place, but none of these claims have been substantiated. The case has spawned countless theories, books, and even movies, but the truth about what happened to Jimmy Hoffa has never been conclusively determined. Today, Hoffa's legacy is a complex one. He is remembered both as a tireless advocate for workers and as a figure whose career was deeply entwined with organized crime. His life story reflects the tumultuous and often shadowy history of American labor unions in the mid-20th century, highlighting both their achievements and their darker connections. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. On March 13, 1997, five lights arranged in a V formation appeared above Phoenix, Arizona. The National UFO Reporting Center reported that a retired police officer in Paulden, Arizona, was the first to report the sighting at around 8.16 p.m. More calls from witnesses located south of Paulden soon followed, suggesting that the lights were moving in a southeastern direction. The lights were described by some as orbs or triangles, while others said they were part of a massive silent craft. Another set of up to nine lights appeared in the sky around 10 p.m. that same night. Witnesses reported seeing an outline of a mass behind the lights, but not the mass itself. Air traffic controllers could not locate the lights on the radar, despite confirming their presence in the sky. Phoenix City Councilwoman Frances Barwood launched an investigation and interviewed over 700 witnesses. She claimed that the government had not interviewed even one witness. Interestingly, there were two distinct events reported that night. The second event, involving the stationary lights in the Phoenix area, was later identified by the U.S. Air Force as flares dropped by an A-10 Warthog aircraft during a training exercise at the Barry Goldwater Range in southwestern Arizona. However, this explanation did not satisfy all witnesses or researchers. The phenomenon received significant media coverage and became a topic of ongoing debate and interest within the UFO and paranormal communities. Arizona's then-Governor Fife Symington initially made light of the incident by having an aide dress up in an alien costume during a press conference. However, years later, Symington admitted in interviews that he had witnessed the event himself and believed it to be otherworldly. Despite the military's explanation, the Phoenix Lights remain one of the most well-known and discussed UFO sightings in history. Many people continue to believe that the event involved something more mysterious than military exercises. The Phoenix Lights remain a mystery to this day. The Phoenix Lights have become a significant part of UFO lore, sparking ongoing interest and debate among UFO enthusiasts, skeptics, and researchers. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled.
In the quiet rural town of Keddie, California, a gruesome discovery on April 12, 1981, would shake the community to its core and spawn one of America's most perplexing unsolved crimes. The Keddie Cabin murders, as they came to be known, continue to baffle investigators and true crime enthusiasts more than four decades later. On that fateful spring morning, visitors to Cabin 28 at the Keddie Resort stumbled upon a scene of unimaginable horror. Inside the cabin lay the brutally murdered bodies of Glenna Sue Sharp, 36, her son John, 15, and John's friend Dana Wingate, 17. The victims had been subjected to a savage attack, bearing signs of both blunt force trauma and multiple stab wounds. Adding to the tragedy was the mysterious disappearance of Sue's 12-year-old daughter, Tina Sharp. Initially considered missing, hopes for her safe return were dashed in 1984 when her skeletal remains were discovered in Butte County, approximately 100 miles from the crime scene. The investigation that followed has been marked by controversy and criticism. Law enforcement's handling of the case has been questioned, with some arguing that crucial evidence may have been overlooked or mishandled in the early stages of the inquiry. Over the years, several suspects have been considered, including local residents and family acquaintances, but no charges have ever been filed. The case experienced a resurgence of interest in recent years, fueled by documentaries, podcasts, and the tireless efforts of both official investigators and amateur sleuths. In 2016, a glimmer of hope emerged when the Plumas County Sheriff's Office announced the discovery of new evidence, including a hammer believed to be one of the murder weapons. Despite this development and ongoing investigation efforts, the Keddie Cabin murders remain officially unsolved as of 2024. The case continues to captivate the public imagination, its brutal nature and lingering questions serving as a chilling reminder of the sometimes elusive nature of justice. As time passes, the hope for resolution grows dimmer, but for the families of the victims and those touched by this tragic event, the search for answers continues. The Keddie Cabin murders stand as a dark chapter in California's history, a mystery that may forever remain shrouded in the mists of time. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. The Taos Hum is an intriguing and puzzling auditory phenomenon that has captured the curiosity of scientists and laypeople alike. This persistent, low-frequency noise has been reported by a small percentage of people in and around Taos, New Mexico, and has sparked numerous theories and investigations. Let's delve into what is known about the Taos hum, the efforts to uncover its source, and the various explanations that have been proposed. Characteristics of the Taos hum. The Taos hum is described as a low-pitched droning sound, similar to the noise of a distant diesel engine idling. The frequency of the hum typically falls between 30 and 80 hertz, and its volume can vary. Interestingly, only a small fraction of the population, around 2%, can hear it. These individuals, often referred to as hearers, report that the hum is continuous and more noticeable indoors, especially at night or in quieter environments. Theories and Explanations Despite extensive research, the exact cause of the Taos hum remains elusive. Several theories have been proposed to explain this phenomenon, ranging from environmental and acoustic factors to psychological influences. Environmental factors. Industrial activity. Some believe that industrial machinery or equipment could be generating the hum. However, investigations have often failed to identify a specific source linked to industrial activity, natural phenomena. 
geophysical processes such as seismic activity or volcanic movements are also considered potential causes. These natural events could produce low-frequency sounds that some people might perceive as a hum. Acoustic factors. Infrasound sounds at the edge of human hearing, below 20 hertz, might be responsible for the hum. These can be produced by natural sources like ocean waves or artificial sources such as ventilation systems. Resonance. Certain structures or landscapes might naturally amplify specific frequencies, creating a hum that only some people can hear. Psychological factors. Tinnitus, a condition characterized by ringing or buzzing in the ears, could be mistaken for an external hum. Some hearers might actually be experiencing tinnitus. Sensitivity, some individuals might have heightened sensitivity to specific frequencies, making them more likely to perceive the hum. In the early 1990s, a team of researchers from Los Alamos National Laboratory, the University of New Mexico, Sandia National Laboratories, and other institutions conducted a study to identify the source of the Taos hum. Despite their efforts, they were unable to pinpoint a definitive cause. Surveys and studies in other hum-affected regions have also been inconclusive, with no clear, consistent source identified. The Taos hum has garnered considerable media attention and sparked the interest of researchers and the general public. Documentaries, articles, and scientific inquiries have explored the phenomenon, but it remains a mystery. For some residents of Taos, the hum is more than just a curiosity. It has real-life implications, causing disturbances in their daily lives, including sleep disruption and stress. Several alternative theories have been proposed to explain the Taos hum electromagnetic radiation. Some suggest that electromagnetic waves from power lines or radio towers could be causing the hum. Military operations, speculations about secretive military projects, such as those involving low-frequency radio waves, have also been proposed. However, there is no substantial evidence to support these claims. The Taos hum continues to be an unsolved mystery. Despite extensive research and various theories, no definitive source or explanation has been found. This phenomenon not only highlights the complexities of human perception and the environment, but also serves as a reminder of the many mysteries that still exist in our world. The Taos hum remains a topic of fascination, prompting ongoing curiosity and investigation. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. So, back in 1966, there were these two guys, Manuel Pereira de Cruz and Miguel Jose Viana. They were both electronic technicians from a small town called Campos dos Goitacazes. These guys were pretty smart and skilled in their field. On August 20th, 1966, their bodies were discovered on a hill called Moro do Vintem, near Niteroi, Rio de Janeiro. It was a young kid flying a kite who stumbled upon them. Imagine that, just out there having fun, and he finds these two bodies lying next to each other in a remote area. Now here's where it gets really weird. Both Manuel and Miguel were wearing these strange lead eye masks. They looked like crude sunglasses, but they were made from sheets of lead. They were also dressed in formal suits and had raincoats on. Next to their bodies, there was an empty water bottle, a packet with two wet towels, and a notebook with some very cryptic notes. The notes were in Portuguese and they had instructions like, 1630 be at the agreed place, 1830 swallow capsules, and after the effect protect metals wait for mask signal. It was all very mysterious. When they did the autopsy, they couldn't find a clear cause of death because the bodies were already decomposing. The toxicology reports didn't reveal anything conclusive either. There are so many theories about what happened. Some people think they might have overdosed on some kind of drug or poison but there's no evidence for that. Others believe they were involved in some kind of electromagnetic experiment because of their background in electronics. The masks might have been to protect against radiation. Then there are the more out there theories. Some folks think they were part of an occult or spiritual group, and the notes and masks were part of a ritual. And of course, there's the UFO angle. 
That area has a history of UFO sightings and some people believe these guys were trying to contact extraterrestrials. But the truth is, no one really knows what happened. The capsules they were supposed to take, the purpose of the LED masks, why they chose that specific remote location, and whether they were alone or if someone else was involved, it's all still a mystery. This case has fascinated people for years. It's been the subject of books, documentaries, and countless articles. Even today, it's one of Brazil's most baffling unsolved mysteries. So that's the masks case. It's a story that just keeps you wondering what really happened on that hill in 1966. The shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air. One thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. Picture this. It's 1936 and a geologist named Jim McAllister is trudging across the parched earth of Death Valley. The sun beats down mercilessly, mirages shimmering on the horizon. There on the cracked mud of racetrack playa is a rock. Nothing special about that, you might think. But this rock has a tail, a long carved furrow stretching behind it for hundreds of feet. Jim blinks, rubs his eyes. He's heard whispers, of course, tall tales told by prospectors and park rangers about rocks that move on their own. But he's a scientist, damn it. And rocks don't just get up and walk around. Yet there it is, clear as day. And it's not just one. As he scans the playa, he sees dozens of them, boulders, some weighing up to 700 pounds, all with these mysterious trails behind them. For nearly a century, the sailing stones of Death Valley have puzzled scientists, sparked conspiracy theories, and drawn curious visitors from around the world. Native Americans whispered about spirit horses dragging the rocks around at night. UFO enthusiasts claimed it was proof of alien technology. Some even suggested the rocks were alive. The truth, when it finally came out in 2014, was almost as fantastic as the myths. A team of scientists, led by paleobiologist Richard Norris, caught the rocks in the act. They fitted 15 rocks with GPS units and set up a weather station. Then, they waited. Two years passed before the conditions were just right. A rare rainstorm flooded the playa with a few inches of water. That night, the temperature plummeted, freezing the top layer into sheets of thin ice. As the morning sun began to warm the air, the ice started to break up. A light breeze picked up and suddenly the rocks began to move. The ice sheets pushed by the wind were bulldozing the rocks across the muddy surface of the playa. Some moved at speeds up to 16 feet per minute. It wasn't magic or aliens or living rocks. It was a perfect storm of rare conditions that might only happen for a few minutes every decade or so. Today, the Sailing Stones remain one of Death Valley's most enigmatic attractions. Protected by law, they continue their slow, mysterious dance across the desert floor. And while we now know the science behind it, standing there on that vast playa, watching those lonely rocks and their trails stretching off into the distance, it's hard not to feel a sense of wonder at the hidden magic of our world. The shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air. One thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. Have you ever heard about the bloop? It's one of those incredible ocean mysteries that had everyone puzzled for years. Picture this, it's 1997 and the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is using this network of underwater microphones or hydrophones scattered across the vast Pacific Ocean. These hydrophones were originally set up to monitor sounds from submarines and underwater volcanic activity, but they ended up capturing something truly bizarre and unexpected. So, in the midst of their usual recordings, they pick up this sound, not just any sound, but an ultra-low frequency noise that was so powerful it could be heard over 5,000 kilometers away, to give you an idea. It was like a deep, eerie roar that rose in frequency rapidly over about a minute. The sound was so intense and widespread that scientists immediately knew they were dealing with something out of the ordinary. The location of this mysterious noise was pinpointed to a remote area of the southern Pacific Ocean, somewhere around 50 degrees south and 100 degrees west, naturally. 
This set off a flurry of speculation and excitement among scientists and enthusiasts alike. Was it a massive underwater creature, some sort of sea monster hiding in the depths, or could it be a gigantic geological event, like a huge underwater volcano, or shifting tectonic plates? For a while, the leading theory was that the bloop might have been produced by a gigantic, undiscovered marine animal. After all, the sound profile was somewhat similar to noises made by marine life, just on a much, much larger scale. Can you imagine, a creature so huge that its calls could be heard halfway across the ocean? It was like something straight out of a sci-fi novel but as scientists dug deeper, they began to consider other possibilities. They compared the bloop to known sounds and analyzed various factors. Over the next few years, more clues emerged, pointing towards a more plausible, if less fantastical, explanation. In 2012, NOAA scientists announced that the bloop was consistent with the noises generated by icequakes. These are sounds that occur when massive icebergs crack and fracture, creating powerful underwater sounds. The conclusion was that the bloop was likely caused by a large iceberg breaking apart, and caving in the frigid waters of the southern Pacific. While it wasn't a colossal sea monster, the idea of these giant chunks of ice creating such an eerie and powerful sound was still pretty awe-inspiring. Even though the mystery was scientifically resolved, the bloop continued to capture the public's imagination. It was featured in documentaries, articles, and even inspired elements of speculative fiction. People love a good mystery, especially when it involves the uncharted depths of our oceans. To this day, the bloop remains a fascinating example of how much we have yet to discover about our planet's oceans. Who knows what other sounds and secrets are lurking beneath the waves, waiting to be uncovered by curious minds and advanced technology. The ocean is vast, mysterious, and full of wonders, and the bloop is just one chapter in its ever-unfolding story. the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. Let me tell you about one of the most intriguing mysteries in aviation history. The disappearance of Frederick Valentich. Picture this, it's the evening of October 21, 1978. A young 20-year-old pilot named Frederick Valentich is flying his small Cessna 182 litres aircraft over the Bay Strait, which lies between the Australian mainland and Tasmania. Frederick is no ordinary young man. He's an enthusiastic pilot with dreams of a bright future in aviation. As he's cruising along at about 4,500 feet, something strange catches his eye. He radios Melbourne Flight Service to report an unidentified flying object following him. Frederick describes it as a long, shiny metallic object with green lights. He's calm, but clearly puzzled. The operator on the other end tries to make sense of what he's hearing. UFO sightings aren't exactly in the handbook. Frederick continues to narrate what he's seeing. The mysterious craft is now hovering above him. His voice betrays a hint of anxiety as he mentions that his engine is running rough. The controller asks him to describe the object further. Frederick says the object is not an aircraft. Moments later, his last words come through the radio. That strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. It is hovering, and it's not an aircraft. And then, silence. Imagine the scene back at Melbourne Flight Service. Confusion. Urgency and growing alarm as repeated attempts to contact Frederick go unanswered. A massive search operation is launched, scouring the waters of the Bay Strait and the surrounding areas. But no trace of Frederick or his plane is ever found. It's as if he vanished into thin air. Naturally, theories abound. Some believe Frederick encountered extraterrestrial beings and was possibly abducted by a UFO. After all, several people reported seeing strange lights in the sky. That night, the UFO community has embraced Frederick's story as one of the most credible encounters ever recorded. Others propose more mundane explanations. Perhaps Frederick became disoriented and suffered from vertigo, leading to a fatal crash into the ocean. Some skeptics even suggest he might have staged his disappearance for unknown reasons, though no evidence supports this claim. Years have passed, but the mystery remains unsolved. Frederick Valentich's disappearance continues to fascinate a blend of eerie uncertainty and thrilling speculation. It's a story that lingers, prompting us to wonder about the unknown and the possibility that we might not be alone. Next time you look up at the night sky, you might think of Frederick and his final flight lost somewhere between the stars and the sea. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. 
let me tell you about the Patamski crater, one of the most mysterious and intriguing places in Siberia. About 360 kilometers from the nearest settlement, Badebo, in this isolated area, there's a bizarre geological formation that has baffled scientists for decades. The Patamski crater, also known as the Patamski phenomenon, was discovered in 1949 by a Russian geologist named Vadim Kolpakov. Picture this. Kolpakov was out on a routine geological survey when he stumbled upon this unusual structure. The locals had already given it a name, Fire Eagle Nest, because of its distinctive shape. So, what does it look like? Well, it's a cone-shaped structure, about 160 meters in diameter and around 40 meters high. There's even a small mound at the center, making it look a bit like a volcanic cone. But here's where it gets interesting. No one really knows how it got there. Over the years, several theories have emerged. One of the main ideas is that it was caused by a meteorite impact. But here's the catch. No meteoritic material has ever been found at the site. Some suggest it could be a result of volcanic activity, but there's no history of volcanism in the region. Others believe it might have been formed by a natural gas explosion, considering Siberia is known for its gas deposits. Then there's the more out there theory of a nuclear blast, either natural or man-made. But again, there's no evidence of radiation to support this. Some scientists even think it could be due to a phenomenon called thermocast, where permafrost melts and collapses, though the exact mechanism is still unclear. Despite numerous expeditions and advanced scientific studies, no one has been able to definitively explain its origin. Scientists have collected geological samples and used modern techniques to analyze the structure, but the mystery remains unsolved. The Patamski crater continues to captivate the imagination of both scientists and the public. It's been featured in documentaries and articles, becoming a symbol of the unexplained. Its remote location and the mystery surrounding it have turned it into a subject of endless fascination. Even today, researchers are still drawn to the Patamski crater, hoping to uncover its secrets. It's a place where the lines between science and mystery blur, leaving us to wonder about the forces that shaped our planet. Next time you think about the vast, unexplored regions of the world, remember the Patamski crater. It's a reminder that despite all our advances, there are still mysteries out there waiting to be solved. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain. The next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. On a fateful day, the 9th of April in the year 1483, Edward IV, King of England, succumbed to the inexorable grip of death, leaving behind a nation and two sons, 12-year-old Edward and 9-year-old Richard. However, the tale takes a dark turn as Richard, Duke of Gloucester, soon sheds his protective guise to reveal a far more sinister ambition. Upon their arrival in London, the princes were ensconced in the Tower of London, a customary residence for royalty awaiting their crowning. Yet within those ancient foreboding walls, Richard had the boys declared illegitimate, thereby clearing his path to the throne, which he seized for himself, becoming the infamous Richard III. The young princes were never seen again. The shadows of history and the pen of Shakespeare have long suggested that Richard ordered the murder of his nephews. Yet, despite the pervasive suspicion, no concrete evidence has emerged, no confessions uttered, no damning proof presented. The plot thickens further still when, after Richard III's death in battle against Henry VII, a new claimant emerged from the mists of obscurity. Arriving in England, a man known as Perkin Warbeck claimed to be none other than Richard of Shrewsbury, the younger of the Lost Princes. He professed that his elder brother had been slain, but he himself had been spared and exiled, bound by a vow of silence. Protected by the loyalists of Edward IV, he had now returned to claim his birthright. Warbeck's tale garnered the support of several European monarchs and in 1495, he landed in Kent, ready to stake his claim. However, Henry VII, resolute and determined, forced him to flee to Scotland, 
where James IV lent him men and arms for a renewed attempt. His promises of lowered taxes won him considerable popular support, yet he was defeated once more by Henry VII. Imprisoned in the very Tower of London from which he claimed to have escaped, Warbeck soon confessed to being an imposter. Nevertheless, his tale did not end there. He managed to escape once more, reiterating his claim to the throne. This final defiance led to his execution. Centuries later, the enigmatic figure of Perkin Warbeck would capture the imagination of Mary Shelley, who immortalized him in her novel, thereby securing his grim place in the annals of English history. And what of the unfortunate princes? On the 17th of July, 1674, workmen at the Tower of London unearthed a wooden box containing two small human skeletons swathed in velvet, perhaps indicating royal blood. The bones were reinterred at Westminster Abbey with a monument erected in their honour. In 1933, a scientific analysis of the remains was conducted, but the results proved inconclusive. The bones mingled with those of chickens and other animals were incomplete, and the examination was far from exhausting. Some have whispered of a reluctance to uncover the truth, another layer of intrigue in this storied mystery. In recent times, calls for a thorough re-examination of the remains have grown louder, especially in light of the successful identification of Richard III's bones beneath a municipal car park. Some believe it would be a fitting twist of fate to confirm that the princes lie in Westminster Abbey while their suspected murderer was unearthed from such a humble resting place. Yet perhaps, the true prince's bones rest beneath a stone marked Perkin Warbeck. Thus, the shadows of history continue to cloak the fate of the princes in the tower, leaving us to ponder, speculate, and await the final unveiling of this centuries-old enigma. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. On the morning of July 2nd, 1951, in the quiet town of St. Petersburg, Florida, the landlady of 67-year-old Mary Reeser noticed something peculiar. The doorknob to Mary's apartment was unusually hot. When repeated knocks failed to rouse her lodger, she contacted the police. They arrived swiftly, forced the door open, and what they found inside left them stunned. Mary Reeser's charred remains sat on an overstuffed easy chair. Part of her left foot, still encased in a slipper, protruded from the ashes. Her backbone, they noted grimly, had fused with the chair's upholstery. Among the ashes, her skull was found astonishingly shrunken to the size of a teacup. The surrounding room was largely unscathed. The wallpaper bore cracks from the heat higher up, but lower down, the walls were pristine. A newspaper lay untouched beside the chair, and the sheets in her bedroom were clean and white. The scene defied all logic. Chief J.R. Reichart reached out to the FBI, writing to J. Edgar Hoover himself. Dear Mr. Hoover, he began, this fire is too puzzling for the small town force to handle. He included samples from the apartment portions of the rug, rubble from the walls and floor, smoke residues, and pieces of the chair. The investigation, however, yielded no clear answers. It wasn't lightning, napalm, or a fireball. Ray guns, they said, did not exist. Theories ran wild, from freak lightning strikes to some high-tech new weapon. One man wrote to the local newspaper claiming, I seen it happen before. As the story gripped the nation, one possibility lingered in the public's mind. Spontaneous human combustion, SHC. Tales of SEC had persisted for centuries. Herman Melville, the author of, claimed to have witnessed it at sea, and Charles Dickens wrote about it in Asterisk Bleak House. In the 19th century, hundreds of cases were reported, often attributed to a debauched lifestyle, especially in overweight women. 
As recently as 2010, an Irish coroner had ruled a man's death as SHC. In Mary Reeser's case, the authorities considered her heavy smoking habit a likely factor. Scientists proposed the wick effect, where a body, once ignited, burns slowly, with body fat acting like candle wax and clothing serving as the wick. An intoxicated person might not react quickly enough to the growing heat. The FBI concluded that Mary might have dropped a cigarette on herself, slowly burning to death. Yet, dissenting voices remained. Wilton M. Krogman, an anthropologist from the University of Pennsylvania, doubted the explanation. There should have been more burning in the apartment, he argued. The debate over SHC and Mary Reeser's death persists to this day. Mary Reeser's family, however, accepted the FBI's findings. They believed her spirit lingered in the apartment. When visitors felt an inexplicable breeze, the family would smile and say, that's grandma, don't worry, she's nice. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. On a chilly Sunday morning, February 8, 1981, San Francisco's Golden Gate Park became the scene of a horrifying discovery. Leroy Carter Jr., a 29-year-old homeless man known to frequent the park, was found dead on the bench he had claimed as his nightly refuge. What made this crime scene particularly disturbing was not just the pool of blood surrounding Carter's sleeping bag, but the shocking nature of his demise. Carter's head had been severed from his body with surgical precision. The coroner would later note, the cut was very clean, like an expert did it. But the decapitation was only the beginning of this macabre tableau. Where Carter's head should have been, investigators found a chicken wing and kernels of corn forcibly inserted into the neck cavity. Fifty yards from the gruesome scene, police discovered the carcass of a headless chicken, missing the same wing found with Carter's body. The initial police report was stark in its brevity. It appears the victim was sleeping in the bushes, when person or persons unknown to us at this time came along and decapitated him. Faced with such an unusual and disturbing crime, the San Francisco Police Department turned to one of their own experts, Officer Sandy Gallant. Gallant had recently gained notoriety for her work on the Jim Jones case, investigating the infamous cult leader responsible for the Jonestown massacre in Guyana. This experience had led her to become something of an authority on cults and occult practices within the department. Her expertise would prove invaluable in unraveling the mystery surrounding Carter's death. Delving into her research, Gallant uncovered connections to the Palomayombe cult, a syncretic belief system that blended elements of Aztec blood rituals, Haitian voodoo, Catholicism, and in some cases, devil worship. Palomayombe was a branch of Santeria, an Afro-Caribbean religion with roots tracing back to Nigeria some 500 years ago. Brought to the Americas by enslaved Africans, these beliefs had evolved and adapted over centuries. While human sacrifice was not typically associated with Palo Mayombe, Gallant discovered historical incidents bearing an uncanny resemblance to Carter's decapitation. She presented her findings to the police department, emphasizing that understanding the motive behind the head's removal was crucial to solving the case. According to Gallant's research, the head, including the eyes, ears, and brain, would be used to create a potent ritualistic brew. This concoction would then be consumed by the practitioner over a 21-day period. Following this, the skull would be kept for another 21 days, during which time the priest might sleep near it and a ceremonial cauldron if deemed appropriate. On the 42nd day after the ritual began, tradition dictated that the remaining skull be returned to a location close to where it was initially taken, as a sacred act of completion. Despite the compelling nature of Gallant's theory, skepticism prevailed within the department. This was, after all, modern-day America, not some remote jungle where such primitive practices might be expected. As a result, traditional investigative methods took precedence, and Gallant's warnings went largely unheeded. The consequences of this decision became apparent on March 22, 1981, exactly 42 days after Carter's murder. True to Gallant's prediction, 
Carter's decomposed head was discovered near the original crime scene. Had officers been stationed there, as Gallant had suggested, they might have caught the perpetrator in the act of returning the grisly trophy. The case of Leroy Carter Jr. remains unsolved to this day, a chilling reminder of the dark undercurrents that can exist even in the heart of a modern metropolis. It stands as a testament to the importance of considering unconventional perspectives in criminal investigations and the potential consequences of dismissing expert opinions that fall outside the mainstream. The story of Carter's murder continues to fascinate and disturb, serving as a grim footnote in San Francisco's history and a cautionary tale about the persistence of ancient shadowy practices in our contemporary world. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. All right, imagine this. It's December 2016, and a CIA officer checks into the American Embassy's health office in Havana feeling nauseous, with a pounding headache and dizziness. Not long after, two more CIA officers show up with the same symptoms. Fast forward to late 2018 and we're talking about 26 Americans and 13 Canadians experiencing similar issues. Nausea, hearing loss, vertigo, nosebleeds, and problems focusing. What's really bizarre is that every single one of these people claimed their symptoms started after hearing a strange noise in their homes or hotel rooms. One person said the noise was high-pitched, another described it as a beam of sound, pointed into their rooms, and some said it sounded like marbles rolling on the floor. Medical experts from the University of Pennsylvania examined some of the victims and found concussion-like symptoms, but no actual concussions. Is the Cuban government behind this? Well, the Cubans have strongly denied any involvement, and a lot of American investigators believe them. They still don't have a clue who or what is making these people sick. There's also a theory about ultrasound. Some believe that maybe Cuban agents placed two covert eavesdropping devices too close together, causing a reaction similar to microphone feedback. But the FBI hasn't found any evidence to support this theory. An ultrasound is actually above the range of human hearing. To make things even more confusing, recordings of the sounds were studied by scientists, and two of them think the recordings captured the sound of lovelorn male crickets. Alexander Stubbs from the University of California, Berkeley, pointed out that these insects are incredibly loud. You can hear them from inside a diesel truck going 40 miles an hour on the highway, he said, but that still doesn't explain why these sounds would make people sick. Maybe it was just nerves? Cuba is a high-threat, high-stress post, a former embassy official told ProPublica.org. Diplomats are warned that there will be surveillance. There will be listening devices in your house, probably in your car. For some people, that puts them in a high-stress mentality, in a threat anticipation mode. That could be true. But then, how do you explain what happened in China? In May 2018, an American at the consulate in Guangzhou was diagnosed with the same mysterious illness. In the end, 15 Americans had to be evacuated from China. The cause of these brain injuries is still a mystery, but the consequences are crystal clear. The U.S. pulled 60% of their diplomats from Cuba and kicked 15 Cuban diplomats out of Washington, D.C. These strange sounds could very well be the first shots fired in a new kind of Cold War. While these mysteries are perplexing, there's hope that science will eventually give us the answers we need. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. From 1917 to 1928, half a million people experienced a condition so terrifying it could be straight out of a horror movie. Imagine being fully conscious but unable to move, trapped in your own body. This was the reality for the victims of encephalitis lethargica, also known as the sleeping sickness. It first emerged in Europe and spread rapidly, reaching epidemic levels in North America, Europe, and India by 1919. Tragically, about a third of those affected died. Of the survivors, nearly half ended up in a state where they could not physically interact with the world around them, despite being fully aware of their surroundings. Occasionally they could speak, move their eyes, or even laugh, but mostly they remained motionless for hours, days, weeks, or even years. The cause of this dreadful condition remains a mystery. 
One theory suggests it might be due to brain inflammation triggered by a rare strain of Streptococcus, the bacteria that causes many sore throats. It's believed that this bacteria mutated, causing the immune system to mistakenly attack the brain, leaving the victim utterly helpless. But here's the really baffling part. The illness vanished almost as mysteriously as it appeared only to resurface sporadically. For instance, it re-emerged in Europe in the 1950s, and more recently about 10 years ago, a 12-year-old girl in China was hospitalized for five weeks with the disease. These sporadic occurrences raise the unsettling question, could encephalitis lethargica make a large-scale comeback? A 2004 analysis of 20 patients with symptoms strikingly similar to encephalitis lethargica concluded that the condition is still prevalent. This finding suggests that what seemed like a nightmare from the past could still be lurking around us. The so-called sleeping sickness of history remains a haunting mystery, leaving us to wonder if and when it might strike again. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. Hey, have you ever heard about Area 51? It's this super secretive U.S. military base located in southern Nevada. For the longest time, its very existence was shrouded in mystery. It wasn't until 2013 that the CIA had to come clean about it due to a Freedom of Information Act request from way back in 2005. So, what's the deal with Area 51? Well, if you look at the historical evidence, it seems like the base is primarily used for developing and testing experimental aircraft and weapons. The U-2 spy plane, for instance, was tested there back in the 1950s. The SR-71 Blackbird and the stealth fighter F-117 Nighthawk were also part of the projects tested in this secluded location. They needed a secret spot away from prying eyes to experiment with these advanced technologies, and the vast desert of Nevada provided the perfect cover. However, if you are hoping to catch a glimpse of what's going on there through public satellite images on Google Maps, you're out of luck. They don't show anything useful. The images are either too blurry or strategically altered to keep things under wraps. Even the people who are allowed to visit Area 51 aren't given the full picture. They're flown in from Las Vegas on these unmarked planes operated by an airline called Janet. And get this, the windows are covered up when the planes descend so no one can see where they're landing or what's around. These flights are so secretive that even spotting one in the sky sparks curiosity among aviation enthusiasts and conspiracy theorists. All this secrecy has, of course, led to a ton of rumors and conspiracy theories. Some folks think the government is hiding crashed UFOs and even conducting tests on aliens there. This idea really took off after an alleged incident in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947, where a UFO supposedly crashed. People believe the wreckage and possibly even the extraterrestrial beings were brought to Area 51 for examination. Others have even wilder ideas. Research on time travel, teleportation experiments, meetings with extraterrestrials, weather control, and activities tied to a supposed shadowy one-world government. The theories are endless and often outlandish. For example, there are claims that the government is developing time machines or teleportation devices that could revolutionize transportation and warfare. Some think scientists at Area 51 are working on ways to control the weather, possibly for military purposes or to combat climate change. Where do these theories come from? That's as big a mystery as Area 51 itself. But one thing's for sure, people love a good conspiracy theory. The allure of the unknown and the thrill of piecing together clues, no matter how tenuous, keeps these stories alive. Remember when some believed the 1969 moon landing was faked? Spoiler alert, it wasn't. The moon landing conspiracy theory was debunked many times over, yet it still captures the imagination of a segment of the population. So while we might never know everything that happens in Area 51, it certainly fuels a lot of interesting discussions and wild imaginations. The intrigue surrounding this base keeps it at the center of countless books, movies, and TV shows. It's a perfect example of how secrecy can breed speculation and how a place can become legendary simply because of what we don't know. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. Hey, 
you won't believe what I recently learned about. So picture this, it's 1982, and there's this guy named Robert Marx diving in Guanabara Bay, Brazil. Now usually you might expect to find some junk there, but what Marx found was totally out of this world. So get this, in an area underwater about the size of three tennis courts about 15 miles from shore, he stumbles upon around 200 Roman ceramic jars. Can you believe it? Some of them were even fully intact. Marx, being a professional treasure hunter, knew exactly what he was looking at. These were twin-handled amphorae, the kind Romans used back in the 3rd century to transport stuff like grains and wine. But here's where it gets really wild. How the heck did these end up in Brazil? I mean, the first Europeans didn't even set foot in Brazil until 1500. That's over a thousand years later. It's mind-boggling, right? Now you might be wondering, didn't the Romans just stick to the Mediterranean and Middle East for trading? And you'd be right, mostly. They weren't really into long ocean voyages, but get this, they did make it as far as India. So maybe, just maybe, one of their ships got seriously off course. I've been thinking about it and I've got a couple of theories, maybe some poor navigator got completely lost during a storm. Or here's a juicy one, what if there was a mutiny and the crew decided to head west? We might never know for sure but it's fun to speculate isn't it? Oh and here's where it gets even more intriguing. In 1983, just a year after Marx made this incredible discovery, Brazil went and closed off the whole area. They said it was to stop looting, but Marx thinks there's more to it than that. He believes the government didn't want anyone digging around there because finding Roman artifacts would mess with the official story that the Portuguese were the first Europeans to reach Brazil. You know, it really makes you think about how much we still don't know about history. I mean, who knows what other surprises might be hiding out there just waiting to be discovered. It's wild to think that something as seemingly straightforward as who reached Brazil first could potentially be turned on its head by some old jars at the bottom of the ocean. And here's a bit more info I dug up. Apparently Marx wasn't the only one to find evidence of possible pre-Columbian contact in Brazil. There have been other controversial discoveries like inscriptions that some claim to be Phoenician. And get this, in 1976 a fisherman found a Roman coin off the coast of Venezuela. It's all pretty disputed stuff in the archaeological world, but it sure does make you wonder, doesn't it? Anyway, I just thought that was such a cool story. It's like a real-life Indiana Jones adventure but with more questions than answers. What do you think? Could the Romans have made it to Brazil way back when, or is there some other explanation we're not thinking of? As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. Hey, did you know that nowadays about a quarter of Americans actually believe in reincarnation? It's pretty wild when you think about it. Now I know a lot of scientists tend to dismiss this kind of thing, but every now and then, you come across a story that's so mind-blowing and hard to explain that it makes even the skeptics scratch their heads. Let me tell you about the Pollock sisters. It's a crazy story that happened back in the 1950s. So in 1957, there were these two English girls, Joanna and Jacqueline Pollock. Joanna was 11 and Jacqueline was six. Tragically, they both died in a car accident. It's heartbreaking, right? But here's where it gets weird. A year later, their mom gave birth to twins, Jillian and Jennifer. Now, when these twins got old enough to talk, they started doing some really strange things. They'd ask for toys that used to belong to their dead sisters, toys they shouldn't have known anything about. They'd point out places that only Joanna and Jacqueline would have known, like their old school. And get this, there was this one time when they saw a car just sitting there, engine running, and they freaked out. They were screaming, that car is coming to get us. It's like they were reliving the accident or something. This went on until the twins were about five years old, and then it started to taper off. They grew up to be normal kids after that. But man, those first few years were wild. The story got so much attention that it caught the eye of this psychologist named Dr. Ian Stevenson. He was really into studying reincarnation, spent his whole career looking into thousands of cases like this. He even wrote a book about 14 cases he thought were legit, and the Pollock sisters were one of them. Stevenson was a pretty respected guy in his field. He was born in 1918 and passed away in 2007. He was the head of the Department of Psychiatric Medicine at the University of Virginia School of Medicine for 50 years. His work was all about trying to find scientific evidence for reincarnation. Now, I'm not saying I believe in reincarnation or anything, but stories like this, they definitely make you wonder, don't they? 
What do you think about all this? As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. Hey, have you ever heard about the Voynich Manuscript? It's this fascinating roughly 250-page book that's written in an entirely unknown language or writing system. What's even more intriguing is that it's been carbon dated back to the 1400s, so it's really old. The manuscript includes illustrations of plants that don't resemble any known species, which just adds to its mystery. The book is named after a Polish book dealer, Wilfred Voynich, who bought it in 1912. Before that, its first confirmed owner was Georg Baresch, an alchemist from Prague who lived from 1585 to 1662. Baresch found the manuscript taking up space uselessly in his library and tried to figure out where it came from but had no luck. The manuscript passed through many hands over the centuries until Voynich got a hold of it. He had some interesting theories about its origin, suggesting it might have been written by Albertus Magnus, an alchemist, or Roger Bacon, an early scientist. However, there's a twist. Some people think Voynich himself might have fabricated the whole thing, along with its history. There have been various other hoax theories over the years, but these don't quite explain the carbon dating of the paper and ink, which firmly places it in the 1400s. In addition to the mysterious script and illustrations, the Voynich manuscript contains sections that seem to be about herbal medicine, astronomical charts, and possibly recipes. Some illustrations appear to show women bathing in what could be medicinal baths, suggesting that it might have been intended as a medical or alchemical text. However, without being able to read the text, it's all speculative. In recent years, some computer scientists and linguists have used AI and machine learning to try and decode the manuscript. But even these advanced techniques haven't cracked the code. Speaking of hoaxes, did you know that about one third of people can't tell if photos have been manipulated? It's crazy to think about how easily we can be fooled by images these days. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain. The next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. Let me tell you about one of the most infamous criminal cases in American history. It all started on a warm June evening in 1994 in Los Angeles. Nicole Brown Simpson, the ex-wife of football legend O.J. Simpson, and her friend Ronald Goldman were brutally murdered outside Nicole's home. Picture this, it's June 12th, and Nicole's out having dinner with her kids at a local restaurant called Mezzaluna. Later that night, Ronald, who worked at the restaurant, stops by Nicole's place to drop off some glasses her mother had left behind. Meanwhile, OJ and his friend Cato Kalin are grabbing a quick bite at McDonald's. Now, here's where things get interesting. Around 10.25 that night, OJ's limo driver shows up to take him to the airport for a red-eye flight to Chicago. OJ takes off at 11 p.m., but just over an hour later, Nicole and Ronald's bodies are discovered. Can you imagine the shock of the neighbors who found them, led there by Nicole's poor dog barking nonstop? The police arrive and find some pretty damning evidence, a bloody glove, a knit cap, and bloody footprints. When OJ lands in Chicago, he gets the news about Nicole and heads back to LA, where the police question him for hours. Now, get this. A few days later, on June 17th, OJ is charged with both murders, but instead of turning himself in, he takes off in his white Ford Bronco, leading police on a slow-speed chase that had the whole country glued to their TVs. It was surreal, watching this football hero trying to evade the law on live television. What follows is a trial that captivated the nation. OJ assembles this all-star team of lawyers, they called them the Dream Team, including big names like Robert Shapiro and Johnny Cochran. On the other side, you've got these determined prosecutors, Marsha Clark and William Hodgman, trying to prove O.J. guilt. The trial was like a soap opera with twists and turns that kept everyone on the edge of their seats. The defense team went after the DNA evidence hard, arguing that it couldn't be trusted. And in the end, despite what seemed like strong evidence against him, 
OJ was found not guilty on October 3, 1995. You know what's crazy? To this day, no one else has ever been seriously investigated for these murders. Nicole and Ronald's killer is still out there, and their families are still waiting for justice. This case wasn't just about a celebrity on trial. It touched on so many hot-button issues in America, race, celebrity, the justice system, domestic violence. It's a story that still fascinates people nearly 30 years later, and I bet we'll be talking about it for years to come. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. Hold tight for the next one. Ahem. In the verdant fields of Bavaria where the setting sun casts a golden glow upon the rolling hills and babbling brooks, there lay a farm, a place of simple living and honest toil, Hinterkaifeck. But on that fateful eve of the 31st of March, in the year of our Lord 1922, a pall of darkness descended upon this rustic abode, for a malevolent force had taken root within its very walls. Six souls, bound by the sacred ties of family and the unbreakable bonds of service, were cruelly rent asunder by the savage blows of a pickaxe, wielded by a hand as merciless as the grave itself. Andreas and Casilia Gruber, the steadfast pillars of this humble homestead, their beloved daughter Victoria Gabriel, a widow in the prime of her life, and her cherished offspring, Casilia and Josef, the very embodiment of innocence, all fell victim to this unspeakable act of violence. Even the faithful Maria Baumgartner, a newcomer to these environs, hired but that very morn, was not spared the murderer's wrath, her life snuffed out upon her humble pallet. But the malignancy that had taken root here knew no bounds, for even in the wake of this abhorrent carnage, the daily rituals of the farm persisted as though naught were amiss. The cattle were tended, victuals prepared and the very hearth stoked, sending plumes of smoke skyward as a grim signaller of the unholy acts concealed within. So complete was the deception that even the humble mailman, on his appointed rounds, detected naught awry, the family's canine companion docilely awaiting his master's return. It was not until the following day that the terrible truth was laid bare, the broken and bloodied forms of this ill-fated clan discovered in a ghastly tableau within the very barn that had sheltered their labours. A scene so grotesque, so utterly at odds with the tranquil beauty of their surroundings, that it would forever scar the memories of those unfortunate few who bore witness. For Maria Baumgartner had been preceded by another, a maid who had fled in terror mere months before, driven away by the relentless patter of footsteps in the attic and the disembodied murmurs that seemed to issue from the very walls themselves. The Grubers, too, had not been spared these otherworldly visitations, for keys had gone astray, strange newspapers appeared as if by sorcery, and the very tools of their trade bore the unmistakable marks of tampering. Andreas himself had borne witness to footprints, inhuman in their provenance, leading from the sheltering woods towards the threshold of their home, as though some malign spirit had been beckoned forth from the very bosom of nature itself. Though the arms of the law stretched forth, grasping at every whisper of evidence, every fleeting shadow of a clue, the truth remains obfuscated to this very day. 
the files, now yellowed with age and stained with the tears of the bereft, were at last closed in the year 1955, the house itself reduced to rubble as though to exorcise the lingering miasma of evil that had so thoroughly permeated its timbers. Yet even now, the echoes of that fateful night seem to reverberate through the mists of time, a reminder that even in the most bucolic of settings, the depths of human depravity know no bounds, and that the veil between the realms of the living and the dead is forever gossamer thin. Hold tight for the next one. On September 7, 1996, the lights of the MGM Grand Casino in Las Vegas blazed with the fervor of a Mike Tyson boxing match. Among the crowd was Tupac Shakur, the well-known rapper whose life was a constant blend of talent and tumult. He stood beside Shug's Knight, the imposing CEO of Death Row Records, watching Tyson's brutal efficiency in the ring. When the match ended, the scene shifted. In the lobby of the MGM, tension crackled. Tupac and his bodyguards clashed with Orlando Anderson, a Compton-based Southside Crips gang member. The fight was fierce but brief, quickly broken up. The night continued its sinister course as Tupac and Knight left in Knight's car, an entourage of cars trailing behind them like shadows. At the intersection of Flamingo and Koval, the night turned deadly. A white Cadillac pulled up beside them, and gunfire erupted. Bullets shattered the night. Tupac was hit four times, a bullet fragment grazed Knight's head. In the chaos, life and death danced a violent waltz. Chris Carroll, a retired LVPD sergeant, later recounted being the first officer at the scene. He opened the car door and Tupac tumbled out, bloodied and broken. Carroll asked, Who shot you? With a deep breath, Tupac mustered only a defiant curse before slipping into unconsciousness. Rushed to UMC, Tupac was placed on life support, a medically induced coma, holding him in a fragile grasp. For six days, the world held its breath. On September 13, 1996, Tupac Shakur died from his injuries, silencing a voice that had both inspired and enraged. He was 25. The investigation that followed was marked by shadows and silence. Las Vegas police made no arrests, and Yaki Gaddafi, a member of Tupac's entourage who claimed he could identify the shooter, was never interviewed. Two months later, Gaddafi himself was murdered, and with him, went potential answers. Years have passed, and the questions remain. The killer's identity is still a mystery, a phantom lurking in the memories of that night. No arrests have been made, and the truth of Tupac Shakur's final moments is locked away, a riddle unsolved in the desert heat of Las Vegas. tight for the next one. In June 2014, Maria and Derek Broadus, along with their three young children, prepared to move into their new home at 657 Boulevard in Westfield, New Jersey. They called it their dream home, just a couple of blocks from Maria's childhood residence, in one of the top 30 safest cities in the United States. Three days after closing the sale before the family had even moved in, 
a letter arrived in their new mailbox. It was addressed to the new owner in big, clunky handwriting. The typed letter read, Dearest new neighbor at 657 Boulevard, allow me to welcome you to the neighborhood. How did you end up here? Did 657 Boulevard call to you with its force within? 657 Boulevard has been the subject of my family for decades now, and as it approaches its 110th birthday, I have been put in charge of watching and waiting for its second coming. My grandfather watched the house in the 1920s, and my father watched in the 1960s. It is now my time. Who am I? There are hundreds and hundreds of cars that drive by 657 Boulevard each day. Maybe I'm in one. Look at all the windows you can see from 657 Boulevard. Maybe I am in one. Look out any of the many windows in 657 Boulevard at all the people who stroll by each day. Maybe I am one. After receiving the letter, the Broadus family contacted the previous owners, John and Andrea Woods. They stated that during their 23 years at 657 Boulevard, they had never received a letter like that, except for one a few days before they moved out. The Woods had never felt watched and rarely locked their doors at night. Though they found the note odd, they dismissed it. However, both families went to the police with the letter, and an investigation began. The police advised them to keep quiet about the letters, even from their neighbors, who were now suspects. Two weeks later, the Broadus family, still not moved in, received a second letter with even more chilling details about the family, including the children's birth order and nicknames. The watcher asked, Will the children sleep in the attic? Or will you all sleep on the second floor? Who has the bedrooms facing the street? I will know as soon as you move in. It will help me to know who is in which bedroom. Then, I can plan better. By the end of 2014, the case had stalled. There was no digital trail, no fingerprints, no way to place someone at the scene. The letters had taken a mental toll on the Broadus family. Six months after receiving the letters, they decided to sell the home. 657 Boulevard has been sold and is currently off the market, while the identity of the watcher remains a mystery. Hold tight for the next one. Alexis Patterson went missing from Milwaukee in 2002. She was seven years old, dropped off at school by her stepfather, but she never made it inside. Speculation swirled around her mother and stepfather, with many believing they were involved. However, there was never enough evidence to arrest them. They both insisted on their innocence. The morning Alexis disappeared, she had argued with her mother, Ayana Patterson, over cupcakes. Alexis wanted to bring the treats to school, but she hadn't completed her homework. As a result, her mother did not allow her to take the cupcakes. This small argument would become a haunting detail in the larger narrative of her disappearance. Laren Bourgeois, Ayana's husband and Alexis's stepfather, reported to the police that he and his son had walked Alexis to the corner between their home and the school. They left her with a crossing guard, who, according to records, was a fifth grader. This would be the last confirmed sighting of Alexis. The reports from that morning are conflicting. Some witnesses claimed they saw Alexis on the school grounds. Others insisted she never arrived. This discrepancy added to the confusion and mystery surrounding her disappearance. Each account only deepened the uncertainty and fear that gripped the community. Two weeks after Alexis went missing, FBI behavioral analysts offered their conclusions. They believed Alexis was most likely the victim of an emotion-based homicide at the hands of her mother. Another possibility, though deemed less likely, was that she had been the victim of a neighbor. 
The analysts noted numerous discrepancies in the statements given by Patterson and Bourgeois to law enforcement, friends, and the media. With little physical evidence to support either theory, the case remains unresolved. Alexis's disappearance continues to haunt those who remember her, a tragic mystery that has yet to find a conclusion. Hold tight for the next one. The morning sun rose brilliant over Little Rock that fateful October day in 2015. Pretty 18-year-old Ebby Stepatch made plans to meet friends, kissing her grandparents goodbye. She slid into her Volkswagen Passat and drove off, never to return alive. Her unsuspecting mother, Laurie, had been out to dinner with her husband that evening, unbeknownst to them. Ebby had earlier texted her boyfriend, Michael. She had been raped at a party by a group of men who filmed the assault. Trembling, she begged Michael to accompany her to the police. He agreed driving Laurie home first before attempting to coordinate with the shaken girl, but Ebby fell ominously silent. For 24 harrowing hours, her family heard not a word. Then came a panic call to her brother Trevor around 5.30pm the next day. Ebby was trapped, disoriented, locked inside her own vehicle, yet unable to relay her whereabouts. Those frantic words proved the last anyone would hear her voice. Police showed no urgency when Laurie reported her daughter missing that sleepless night. They dismissed it as a runaway case, ignoring the mother's pleas that something was terribly wrong. Days later, Ebby's abandoned Passat was discovered at Charlemont Park. Keys still inside, makeup catastrophically spilled, gas tank drained, but no trace of the teenage beauty. Half-hearted park searchers dragged on three years as incompetent investigators bungled the baffling case. Laurie endured a waking nightmare, fending off cruel ransom scams claiming to have kidnapped Ebby while her futile hope withered. Finally, in 2018, retired detective Tommy Hudson re-examined the case with fresh determination. Instinct drew him back to the park's drainage pipes just yards from the abandoned vehicle. There, he found Ebby's decaying remains stuffed inside the narrow pipe, so achingly close, yet tragically overlooked. The anguished family wept that their Ebby had been mere steps away while police fumbled the search. Laurie raged that tiny miracles like finding her killer still glimmered, if only the original effort was thorough. To this day, the oppressive Arkansas humidity hangs thick with the mystery of what transpired that October day to leave a teenage beauty so cruelly desecrated. The stagnant case offers no answers, only the rancid smell of justice shamefully delayed. Hold tight for the next one. In 1976, the quiet town of Circleville, Ohio was shattered. Letters came postmarked from Columbus bearing no return address. They were venomous, filled with accusations and threats. The target was Mary Gillespie, a school bus driver and the school superintendent accused of an illicit affair. One letter reached Mary's husband, Ron. It told him to end the affair or die. The letters were relentless, each one more ominous than the last, casting a shadow over the town's tranquility. The tension escalated in 1977 when Ron died under mysterious circumstances. It was a one-car crash, but there were gunshots. The sheriff called it an accident, but doubts lingered. The wreckage of Ron's truck and the presence of a fired gun at the scene raised questions. People whispered about foul play, suspecting that the letter writer's threats had been realized. The sheriff's ruling did little to calm the growing unease. Fear took root in Circleville as the sinister presence of the anonymous writer loomed larger. As the investigation unfolded, suspicion turned to Paul Freshour, Ron's sister's husband. In a twist of fate, a booby-trapped pistol meant to kill Mary Gillespie was linked to him. Freshour was arrested and, despite his protest of innocence, was convicted of writing the letters and attempting murder. He was thrown behind bars, but the Circleville letters didn't stop. They continued to arrive, filled with the same vitriol and threats, terrorizing the residents throughout the late 1970s and early 1980s. Even Freshour himself received one in prison, further muddying the waters of his supposed guilt. The persistence of the letters during Freshour's imprisonment deepened the mystery. How could the letters continue if the alleged writer was incarcerated? 
The authorities had no answers, and the letter's sinister tone seemed to mock their efforts. Each new letter brought a fresh wave of dread, suggesting that the true writer was still at large, or that perhaps there was more than one person involved in this campaign of terror. The unanswered questions gnawed at the town, leaving a lingering sense of insecurity. In 1994, after serving a decade in prison, Paul Freshour was released. He maintained his innocence until his death in 2012, steadfastly claiming he had no part in the letters or the attempted murder. His release did little to dispel the cloud of suspicion that hung over him. For many, the mystery remained unsolved, and the true identity of the Circleville letter writer continued to elude discovery. Fresh Hour's life, marked by accusations and imprisonment, ended with the truth still hidden in the shadows. To this day, the Circleville letters haunt the town. The fear they instilled and the questions they raised remain unresolved. Who was behind the letters? Was it one person or a conspiracy? The letter's legacy is one of dread and speculation, a dark chapter in Circleville's history that refuses to close. The identity of the Circleville letter writer remains a ghost, lurking in the memories of those who lived through the terror, a mystery that may never be solved. tight for the next one. On the night before Christmas in 1945 in Fayetteville, West Virginia, George and Jenny Sodder lay asleep with nine of their children. The house was quiet, wrapped in the stillness that only comes before dawn. Around 1 a.m., the tranquility shattered as a fire erupted. George, Jenny, and four of their children escaped into the cold night. But Morris, 14, Martha, 12, Louis, 9, Jenny, 8, and Betty, 5, remained trapped upstairs. George, frantic, broke back into the house, but the staircase was engulfed in flames. He raced outside to grab his ladder, but it was missing. Desperation drove him to his coal trucks intending to use them as makeshift ladders, but neither would start. Marion, one of the children who had escaped, ran to a neighbor's house to call the fire department. The operator didn't answer. Another neighbor tried, but again no response. Finally, that neighbor drove to town and found Fire Chief F.J. Morris. The fire station was just two and a half miles away, yet the firefighters didn't arrive until 8 a.m seven hours after the fire had begun. By then, the house was reduced to ashes. Authorities sifted through the smoldering remains, searching for traces of the five missing children. They found nothing. Chief Morris suggested the fire had been so intense it had cremated the bodies completely, including the bones. Yet this seemed improbable, for even in the fiercest blazes, bones usually remain. No one reported the smell of burning flesh either. The fire's cause was quickly attributed to faulty wiring, and death certificates were issued for the five children. But George and Jenny were not convinced. George had recently had the wiring checked by the power company which had declared it safe. They began to suspect that their children had been kidnapped, the fire said as a diversion. As the flames consumed their home, a woman claimed she saw the five children peering from a passing car. Another woman, staying at a Charleston hotel, saw the children's photos in the newspaper. She insisted she had seen four of them a week after the fire. The children were with two women and two men, all of Italian descent, she stated. I tried to speak to the children, but the men were hostile and wouldn't allow it. From the 1950s until Jenny Sauter's death in the late 1980s, the Sauter family maintained a billboard on State Route 16, displaying pictures of the five children and offering a reward for information. Sylvia Sauter, the last surviving child, never believed her siblings died in the fire. 
To this day, the fate of Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny, and Betty remains an unsolved mystery. Hold tight for the next one. In the bucolic lanes of Devon, nestled in the southwestern corner of England, a haunting tale unfolds, steeped in sorrow and enigma. On a serene August day in 1978, a young girl named Jeanette Tate, scarcely 13 years of age, embarked upon her routine paper round, pedaling her bicycle with youthful vigor. Yet, a mere seven minutes later, her friends stumbled upon a disconcerting sight. Jeanette's bicycle lay abandoned on the ground, newspapers scattered in disarray. Perplexed, the friends retrieved the bike and brought it to Jeanette's home, thinking perhaps she had wearied of her task. But Jeanette was nowhere to be found. Alarmed, her father, John Tate, reported her missing to the authorities. Thus began one of the most exhaustive searches of its era. Scores of police officers, search dogs, divers and volunteers scoured the countryside, yet no trace of Jeanette emerged. The case, shrouded in mystery, evolved into a murder investigation which remains unresolved to this day. John Tate, a man whose life was indelibly scarred by his daughter's disappearance, dedicated the remainder of his years to seeking answers. The Tate family resided in Aylesbury, near Exeter, at the time of Jeanette's vanishing. John, steadfast in his quest for truth, suspected that Robert Black, a notorious serial child killer, was responsible. Black, who had been convicted of murdering four young girls and was serving a life sentence, died in January 2016 before he could be formally charged in Jeanette's case. In the months following Black's death, the Devon and Cornwall police submitted a comprehensive murder file to the Crown Prosecution Service, seeking a conclusive statement on whether Black would have faced charges had he lived. However, the CPS declined to issue a decision, citing Black's demise as a limiting factor. In his twilight years, John's desperation for closure grew ever more poignant. My life is coming to an end. I dearly want to know where Ginny is. Just to know that she has been found and given a Christian burial would be enough, he lamented. His health already fragile from a major stroke, diabetes and prostate cancer, declined further, and he passed away in a Manchester hospital, never having received the solace he so ardently sought. Though the Jeanette Tate case remains unresolved, the relentless pursuit of truth by her family and the community stands as a poignant reminder of the enduring human spirit in the face of inexplicable loss. Hold tight for the next one. In the small coastal town of Yarmouth, a grim discovery shocked its inhabitants and stirred whispers of a malevolent presence lurking amidst the dunes. In the year of 1900, the body of a young woman was found, her life cruelly choked from her by a mohair bootlace. The town was in turmoil. Questions abounded and suspicion shadowed every corner. Twelve years hence, 
In the fateful year of 1912, another woman met a similarly horrific end, close to the same desolate spot where the first tragedy had unfolded. Strangled with a shoelace in what seemed to be a grim reenactment of the earlier murder, this crime shook the town to its core once more. The chilling query on everyone's lips was unavoidable. How could the same killer be responsible for both deaths when a man had already been executed for the first crime? The ill-fated couple at the center of the first tragedy, Herbert John Bennett and Mary Clark, had married under the shadow of scandal. At the tender age of 20, Mary had hastily wed the 17-year-old Herbert, driven by a youthful romance and an unplanned pregnancy. Their first child was stillborn, casting a pall over their nascent union, while their second was destined for orphanhood before the age of four. The Bennetts engaged in a somewhat dubious enterprise, purchasing cheap violins and selling them as superior instruments to unsuspecting buyers. Herbert's ill-gotten gains funded a small grocery store, which mysteriously caught fire shortly after being insured, a fire from which the Bennetts reaped an acceptable profit, despite the insurance payout falling short of their expectations. A mysterious trip to South Africa added to the intrigue surrounding the couple. Leaving their young daughter behind, they embarked on a long and arduous journey to Cape Town only to return to London after a brief four-day sojourn. The reason for this journey remained an enigma, further clouding their already troubled relationship. Upon their return, the couple's love had waned, replaced by bitter animosity. Their landlady recalled overhearing Mary threaten Herbert with imprisonment, while he, in turn, ominously wished her dead. In August 1900, Herbert whisked Alice away to Great Yarmouth, traveling in first class and staying at the Crown and Anchor. Herbert proposed, and Alice, under the illusion that Herbert was a man of means, accepted. Meanwhile, Mary, perhaps aware of her husband's seaside escapades, decided to take her own autumnal break in Yarmouth, traveling under the pseudonym Mrs. Mary's sojourn in Yarmouth was shrouded in secrecy, staying at a boarding house under the pretense of being a recent widow meeting her brother-in-law. She went out almost every evening, her activities cloaked in mystery. Back in London, Herbert fabricated a story about attending to his dying grandfather in Gravesend. But on September 21st, the Rudgram's daughter overheard Mary conversing with a man whose words hinted at a predicament. Could this man have been Herbert, or was Mary involved with another? The next night, September 22nd, saw Mary donning her finest jewelry and carrying a substantial sum of money. She was last seen in a pub with a man identified by the owner as her estranged husband. That night, her cries for mercy were heard on the beach by Alfred Mason and his girlfriend, Blanche Smith. Unsettled, they left quickly, later realizing they had witnessed the last moments of Mary's life. It took over a month for the authorities to connect the dots. A laundry mark on Mary's clothing led to her identification, and Herbert's duplicity began to unravel. A Scotland Yard inspector discovered enough evidence to arrest him, including the incriminating long chain found among his possessions. Herbert's subsequent trial revealed his deceitful life and suspicious actions surrounding Mary's death. Despite a fervent defense by barrister Edward Marshall Hall, who cast doubt on the chain and produced a questionable alibi, the evidence against Herbert was overwhelming. Alice Meadows' testimony exposed Herbert's fabrications and he was found guilty, maintaining his innocence until his last breath. Herbert was hanged on March 21, 1901 at Norwich Jail, 
with his final words being, I say I am not guilty, sir. His execution was marked by ominous signs, including a snapped flagpole, which some took as a symbol of his innocence. Herbert's body was buried in the prison grounds, now the site of Norwich's Roman Catholic Cathedral. His defense counsel, Marshall Hall, continued to believe in Herbert's innocence, tirelessly seeking a reprieve but to no avail. Mary was laid to rest in Yarmouth's northern cemetery, a grave marked by a coffin-shaped stone. The eerie similarities of Dora May Gray's murder in 1912 to Mary's death reignited fears of a serial killer. Dora, an 18-year-old domestic servant, was found strangled with a shoelace and stockings tied in reef knots, her body left in the dunes near Mary's final resting place. Dora's life was also scrutinized, revealing a lively young woman with a penchant for yachting men, much to the disapproval of the Edwardian society. Despite exhaustive investigations, including questioning numerous suspects and dismissing several false confessions, Dora's murderer was never found. Theories abounded, including a possible connection to the yachtsman Dora favored, but nothing conclusive emerged. In 1965, Paul Capon's book posited that Herbert Bennett was innocent, suggesting instead that Mary's killer was a sailor she had met in South Africa and one of Dora's yachting acquaintances. This theory, though compelling, was considered unlikely by other researchers who believed Dora's death was a tragic coincidence, inspired by the first murder rather than the work of a serial killer. The truth remains elusive, shrouded in the mists of time and the secrets buried with those who knew it. Whether a miscarriage of justice, a chilling coincidence, or the work of a copycat killer, Yarmouth's dark mystery endures, leaving us to ponder the true nature of the horrors that once stalked its sands. Hold tight for the next one. It was just a routine practice bombing operation. Lieutenant Charles Carroll Taylor, boasting over 2,500 flying hours, led his trainees on Flight 19, experienced pilots all. The five planes and 14 crew members leaving Florida expected to return in a few hours. That was December 5, 1945. We are still waiting for them. The practice run was safely completed. The last bomb dropped at 3 p.m. But at 3.45, when the planes should have been nearing the airfield, trouble began. Fort Lauderdale's flight tower received a message from Taylor, who sounded confused and worried. Cannot see land, he said. We seem to be off course. The tower asked for their location. We cannot be sure where we are, the flight leader announced. Repeat, cannot see land. There was silence for 10 minutes. Then another message, not from Taylor. We can't find west. Everything is wrong. We can't be sure of any direction. Everything looks strange, even the ocean. Twenty minutes later, a hysterical voice said, We can't tell where we are. Everything is... Can't make out anything. We think we may be about 225 miles northeast of base. Mumbling followed. Then the final words flight control ever received from Flight 19. It looks like we are entering white water. We're completely lost. Two PBM Mariner flying boats carrying 13 men and rescue equipment were dispatched to Flight 19's last estimated position. Ten minutes later, they sent a message relaying their position. They were never heard from again. In a few hours, seven search planes and 27 men had disappeared into thin air. For five days, searches scoured the 250,000 square miles formed by the Triangle of Florida, Puerto Rico, and Bermuda. None of the aircraft were found and the U.S. Air Force report stated simply, cause unknown. Thus was born the legend of the Bermuda Triangle. Numerous ships had previously vanished in the area, but there was always a rational explanation. To lose so many aircraft and so many men in one go was unprecedented. 
more losses followed. In 1948 and 1949, the Star Tiger and Star Ariel disappeared between Jamaica and Bermuda, taking over 50 souls. Then a Douglas DC-3 went down with 32 passengers. In 1963, two KC-135 Stratotankers collided, yet some claim two sets of debris were found 160 miles apart, and another half dozen small planes have come down there since. No other region on Earth has seen so many mysterious fatalities. Natural explanations abound. Magnetic variations affecting compasses, hurricane activity, violent weather, even undersea bubbles dragging planes and ships down. But none account for the frequency or the peculiar nature of these disappearances. Did the pilots of Flight 19 experience something beyond science's reach? Some propose the Bermuda Triangle is a parallel universe causing warps in time and space that suck victims in. Others suggest it's a hotspot of extraterrestrial activity. There is one other possibility. In 1968, Three divers off the coast of Bimini Island discovered rock formations resembling man-made walls and pavements. Could it be that here, lurking in the depths near where Flight 19 vanished, lies the lost city of Atlantis? Could it be causing disturbances or could it be repopulating? tight for the next one. On December 26, 1996, in Boulder, Colorado, a frantic call was made to police reporting six-year-old John Benet Ramsey as kidnapped from her family's home. Her mother, Patsy Ramsey, had discovered a bizarre ransom note demanding a hefty sum for the young girl's return. The only other people inside the house at the time were John Benet's father, John, and her brother Burke. Tragically, John Benet's lifeless body was found later that same day in the basement of the Ramsey residence. She had duct tape over her mouth, a cord around her neck, and severe head injuries. The autopsy concluded her death was a homicide caused by asphyxiation and craniocerebral trauma. At the time, John Benet was a rising child beauty queen star, having won numerous high profile pageants, a fact that amplified national media attention on the shocking case. Nearly three decades later, the murder remains one of America's most gripping unsolved mysteries. However, recent developments have ignited fresh hope that John Benet's killer may finally be brought to justice. The Boulder Police Department has revealed it is reviewing new recommendations stemming from a secret cold case investigation conducted over the past year. This independent team of elite experts was assembled to re-examine all existing evidence using modern investigative techniques and forensic testing methods unavailable in 1996. Their extensive efforts included digitizing over 21,000 tips, 1,000 plus interviews, physical samples from 200 individuals, and a comprehensive analysis of DNA evidence, which remains a key focal point. The panel was comprised of seasoned professionals from the FBI, Colorado law enforcement agencies, DA's office, and other entities with specialized cold case experience. After their exhaustive year-long review, the team provided undisclosed new recommendations to Boulder investigators on how best to reinvigorate and potentially solve the Ramsey case. Police have stated they are committed to thoroughly pursuing these confidential recommendations. Chief Maris Harold expressed gratitude for the expert analysis, vowing, we will continue to pursue all leads and explore technology advancements to identify JonBenet's killer. Officials have pledged to share any substantive updates with the public and Ramsey family as the revamped investigation unfolds. For those who vividly remember the national fixation on John Bonet's brutal slaying in 1996, this renewed focus provides a glimmer of hope. Perhaps modern forensic science and fresh investigative strategies can finally unravel the mystery that has consumed and eluded America for over a quarter century. John Bonet's family, the city of Boulder, and an intrigued nation await further developments with bated breath. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain. 
the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. The old grandfather clock in the musty hallway struck midnight, its resolute bonds splitting the suffocating silence like an axe through rotten wood. William Wallace started awake, his heart slamming against his ribcage as familiar tendrils of dread wrapped around his psyche. The nightmare had returned, as it did most nights without fail an endless loop of horror seared into his subconscious. Julia's broken body lying before him, her once vibrant face now a mask of fear frozen in death. The crimson stains spreading out across the faded oriental rug like a malignant bloom. The metallic stench of her blood overwhelming his nostrils until he thought he might choke on it. The errand that had started out so innocuously at the chess club. The phony message that had lured him away just long enough for the killer to strike. With trembling hands, Wallace lit the lamp by the bed its feeble glow doing little to pierce the gloom weighing down upon him. Try as he might, he could not escape the loop of images, each one searing deeper into his brain than the last. The frenzied beat of the blood-soaked killer's shoes on the hardwood as he fled. The locked door, both front and back, that should have kept intruders out. The look of blank confusion on the muster showed constable's face as Wallace spun his unbelievable tale. Even now, it all seemed so implausible, so unhinging, like a sordid thriller penned by some novelist with a flair for the perverse. And yet he had lived it, the guilt and the paranoia surrounding him like a cursed, inescapable miasma. First the scandalous guilty verdict, hanging about his neck like a sotted albatross as he awaited the executioner's cold embrace. Then the inconceivable reversal of the appeal and his name cleared sent out into a world that still eyed him with contempt as the fiend who had beaten his wife to death. He ran a weary hand across his damp brow as the lurid details threatened to swallow his sanity yet again. The errand leading him to the non-existent address of 25 men of Gardens East. His timing, his lack of alibi, the circumstantial evidence all damning him. But that was the question that persisted, wasn't it? If he was the killer, why had he appeared so inexplicably neat when questioning the whereabouts of the fictional Mr. Qualtroff? No speck of Julia's blood marring his collar or cravat, not a single hair out of place. Unless he had found the time to meticulously clean himself before appeasing the neighbor's concerns. But the milk boy's insistence of speaking to Julia mere moments before he had left it made the logistics seem muddled, nearly impossible. Sweat beaded on Wallace's brow as the thoughts spiraled the same vicious cycle repeating every night ad nauseum. He rose from the covers, his worn house slippered feet shuffling to the desk where the hate box lay. The violin that had been his singular hobby before, before the tragedy. Back when his only purpose had been providing accompaniment to Julia's beautiful classical compositions on the pianoforte. Lovingly, he removed the instrument, cradling it like a newborn child as memories flooded back of his wife's radiant smile her infectious laughter, all snuffed out in a tempest of unfathomable violence and malice. As the first pale hues of daybreak began painting the curtained windows, Wallace clearly heard the opening refrain of Beethoven's Kreutzer Sonata, Julia's favorite, wafting through the silence. A lump formed in his throat as he pulled the bow across the strings, the familiar melody wrapping around him with a loving embrace he had sorely missed these past years. A single tear traced its way down his weathered cheek. For in that fleeting moment of reverie, amid the persistent nightmare that was his lingering existence, he could almost convince himself that Julia's ethereal presence was still with him. But the notion would prove as ephemeral as the rays of dawn dissipating the night's shadows. The darkness and all the sinister uncertainties it bred would eventually return to haunt him anew. Who or what had truly taken his world from him on that wintry night in 1931? The uncertainty gnawed at his core like a metastasizing cancer. Perhaps it had been the disgruntled co-worker with pension for pilfering company funds, the mechanic's tale of the bloodied glove in his glove box. Or could it have been something other? Some force not constrained by the tiresome laws of the mundane world. Some primordial maleficence slithering through the peripheries of the life William Wallace had known. The violin slipped from his hands, 
clattering lifelessly to the scuffed floorboards as a new series of sobs racked his body. For he could feel the conspiracy theories gathering their persuasive tendrils around his subconscious once more, calling to him from the oblique angles of shadow with their burgeoning mania. Outside, the first call of the morning paperboy's round echoed off the dreary buildings like a harbinger of doom. William Wallace knew there would be no more sleep on this night, or any night for that matter. Not while the mystery of his adored Julia's death went unanswered and fed on the pliant faculties of his unravelling mind. The nightmare was only just beginning. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain. The next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. It was a brisk December morning in 1948, when a horrifying discovery was made on the serene Somerton Beach in Adelaide, Australia. A neatly dressed man, impeccable in his suit and tie with freshly polished shoes, lay motionless on the sand. His body was slumped against a seaside wall, head tilted slightly as if he had dozed off for an eternal slumber. But the vacant stare in his half-open eyes told a more sinister tale. This man was dead. An autopsy revealed no obvious signs of trauma or foul play. No poison coursed through his veins, no violence had been inflicted upon his body. Yet the mystery had only begun to unravel. Not a single item for identification could be found on the dapperly dressed stranger. No wallet, no papers, not even labels on his clothes. The tags had been meticulously removed, a seemingly deliberate act of concealing his identity. The case baffled authorities who dubbed him the Summerton Man. His fingerprints failed to yield a match in their records. Photographs plastered across newspapers yielded no leads, as no one could put a name to the face of this unfortunate soul. Just who was this man? Four months later, a potential clue emerged. A tiny sewn pocket invisibly tucked into the man's trousers contained a scrap of paper, but it only deepened the enigma. The paper was torn from a rare book of poetry, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, bearing the printed words, Tamam Shud, Farsi for ended or finished. A manhunt ensued to find a matching book that could unlock this cipher. When all efforts failed, the unidentified man was laid to rest though his body was embalmed and face cast in plaster, preserving his features should the truth ever come to light. Eight months on, a man brought forward a bizarre lead. He claimed to have found a copy of the Rubaiyat in the rear floor area of his car which he had parked near Somerton Beach around the same time. The torn page matched the scrap in the dead man's pocket, but there were more mysteries entangled between the book's pages, a cryptic code, and a phone number. The number led to a woman named Joe Thompson, who lived just miles away. In a strange twist, she became erratic when shown the plaster bust, feigning illness before denying any knowledge of the man. All she admitted was having gifted that very book to a man named Alfred Boxall. But Boxall was alive and had his copy fully intact. Decades later, the Somerton man's identity and coded messages remain one of Australia's most inscrutable mysteries. Rumors have swirled of him being a Soviet spy or US tracker pursued by ruthless forces. But the truth likely went to the grave with this dapper non-entity from the beach that summer's day in 1948, taking with it the final chapter of his enigmatic story. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. On a fateful day in November 1971, the aviation world witnessed one of the most perplexing and daring hijackings in history. A man, who became known as D.B. Cooper, boarded Northwest Airlines Flight 305 from Portland to Seattle carrying a mysterious briefcase in a brown paper bag. Cooper, described as a well-dressed businessman in his mid-40s, seemed unremarkable at first glance. However, once the flight was airborne, he handed a note to a flight attendant, revealing his true intentions. 
He had a bomb and a set of audacious demands. The note, now etched in aviation lore, demanded $200,000 in cash, exclusively in $20 bills, two front parachutes, and two back parachutes. Cooper also insisted on a fuel truck ready for refueling upon landing, threatening to do the job if his demands were not met. In a tense standoff, the FBI scrambled to assemble the ransom money from Seattle area banks, while local police obtained the requested parachutes from a skydiving school. With his demands fulfilled, Cooper allowed the passengers and some crew members to disembark, keeping the remaining crew on board. As the hijacked aircraft took off again, heading for Mexico City at a low altitude, Cooper donned a pair of dark wraparound sunglasses, an iconic detail that would become forever etched in the collective memory of the case. Somewhere between Seattle and Reno, Nevada, in the dead of night, D.B. Cooper accomplished the unthinkable. He jumped from the rear door of the aircraft, parachutes and ransom money in hand, disappearing into the darkness. Despite an extensive manhunt and decades of investigation by the FBI, the enigmatic hijacker's true identity and fate remained a mystery. No trace of Cooper was ever found, and the case grew into one of the most baffling unsolved crimes in United States history. Numerous theories and potential suspects have surfaced over the years, but none have provided definitive answers. The D.B. Cooper hijacking stands as a testament to the audacity of one man and the enduring power of a well-executed heist, leaving an indelible mark on the annals of aviation and criminal investigations. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. On a September day in 1920, during the bustling lunch hour on Wall Street, an unassuming man driving a horse-drawn wagon made his way through the crowds. He stopped the wagon in front of the U.S. Assay office, across from the famous J.P. Morgan building. After bringing the old horse to a halt, the driver calmly disembarked and disappeared into the masses. Mere minutes later, a thunderous explosion ripped through the financial district as the wagon detonated in a devastating hail of shrapnel. The blast left a staggering toll. Over 30 people killed instantly and 300 more injured. The grisly aftermath unfolded as more victims succumbed to their wounds throughout the day. Initially viewed as a tragic accident, it soon became clear this was an intentional act of terror. As night fell, maintenance crews cleared the wreckage, inadvertently destroying potential evidence that could identify the perpetrators. By the next morning, Wall Street had already resumed business operations as if nothing had occurred. Conspiracy theories swirled, but law enforcement agencies, the New York Police and Fire Departments, the Bureau of Investigation, precursor to the FBI, and the U.S. Secret Service, diligently sought the truth. Hundreds of witnesses were interviewed, yet recollections of the driver and wagon proved vague and unhelpful. The NYPD reconstructed the bomb and fuse mechanism, but debates raged about the explosive materials used. The most promising lead actually preceded the attack. A mailman discovered four crudely printed flyers from a group calling itself the American Anarchist Fighters, demanding freedom for political prisoners. The letters resembled ones from Italian anarchist bombing campaigns the previous year. The Bureau traced the flyers printing across the East Coast to no avail. Based on similar attacks over the previous decade, investigators initially suspected followers of Italian anarchist Luigi Galliani. However, without concrete evidence tying Galliani's adherence to the bombing and with the revolutionary having already fled the country, the case stalled. For three years, leads went cold and trails turned into dead ends. Ultimately, the Wall Street bombers' identities remained a mystery. The 1920 Wall Street bombing represented one of the first major terrorist attacks on U.S. soil. While never officially attributed to a specific group, circumstantial evidence suggests involvement by anarchists and revolutionaries, influenced by figures like Luigi Galliani. The unsolved case prompted the Bureau of Investigation to establish a more robust anti-terrorist capability. It also fueled concerns over radicals and ideological extremists that culminated in the notorious Palmer raids just months after the bombing. Though the perpetrators escaped justice, this deadly event foreshadowed the 20th century threat 
of indiscriminate violence targeting civilians for political aims. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. The Valley of King, 1922. The scorching Egyptian sun beat down on the sandy valley as Howard Carter's excavation team resumed their search. For years they had been hunting for ancient tombs, their efforts interrupted by the Great War. Carter's wealthy patron, Lord Carnarvon, was growing weary of funding this seemingly fruitless endeavour. Failure again in 1921 nearly saw the plug pulled. But somehow Carter convinced Carnarvon to bankroll one final season. On November 4th, a young water boy stumbled upon a peculiar stone. Moving it aside, Carter's eyes widened as a stone staircase emerged from the rubble. Could it be? After decades of futility, had he finally uncovered what he sought? Digging carefully, Carter soon confirmed his wildest dreams, the remarkably intact tomb of King Tutankhamun. For three painstaking weeks, the team burrowed through the underground passages until they reached the sealed burial chamber door. As Carnarvon looked on with bated breath, Carter pried open the portal, catching his first glimpse of glittering treasures within. Yes, wonderful things, he famously uttered about the gold, statues, and mummified animals that no soul had laid eyes upon in over 3,000 years. But this monumental discovery may have come at a grave cost, literally. Soon after breaching the tomb, outlandish rumors of an ancient curse began to swirl. Some claimed an ominous inscription loomed above that entrance, though Carter dismissed such hogwash. Still, a series of bizarre incidents and untimely deaths amongst the expedition seemed to lend credence to the legend of the Pharaoh's curse. First was Carnarvon himself, killed by an infected mosquito bite just months after opening the tomb. Allegedly at the exact moment he perished, Cairo went dark from a freak power outage while his dog howled once before dropping dead back in England. The coincidence seemed too eerie, especially when an autopsy revealed a scar on Tutankhamun's cheek in the same spot Carnarvon had been bitten. More deaths followed of those connected to the discovery, including Carnarvon's relatives. Even the famed Arthur Conan Doyle attributed them to awakened elementals or supernatural beings from the disturbed tomb. The most chilling occurrence involved Carter's beloved canary upon sending for the bird. His messenger arrived to find a live cobra, sacred symbol of pharaohs, with the poor creature's corpse dangling from its jaws. A jackal haunting the camp, reminiscent of Anubis, the ancient deity of the dead, did little to assuage rising fears. Yet Carter stoically pressed on, branded the curse nonsense. Some say he had forged a supernatural pact of his own, as various relics from Tutankhamun's tomb were later discovered stashed in Carter's home, including a protective amulet against evil forces. While Carter survived another 16 years after his historic find, others in the expedition crew perished quickly, like AC. Mace and Carter's own secretary met with an untimely demise within two years, the latter murdered under shady circumstances. Had the irreverent act of disturbing the king's rest truly unleashed an ancient wrath? Or was it merely an incredible string of misfortunes and tragic coincidences? In the end, perhaps Carter did cheat death by appeasing the boy king with illicit offerings. One could imagine the two explorers, the modern and the ancient, sharing spectral laughter in the afterlife at having outsmarted the fabled curse. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. In the shrouded alleyways of London's East End in 1888, a malevolent presence stalked the night, sowing terror throughout the impoverished Whitechapel district. This was the hunting ground of Jack the Ripper, perhaps the most infamous serial killer in history. Though only five victims were definitively linked to his grisly canonical murders, some theorists estimate his real death toll may have reached 11 victims or more. 
His crimes were characterized by unspeakable mutilation and disembowelment of prostitutes who haunted those fog-bound streets of the slums in a desperate bid for survival. From August 7th to September 10th, 1888, the killer's bloody spree paralyzed Whitechapel with fear as the bodies of Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes and Mary Jane Kelly were discovered brutally slain. Letters allegedly penned by the fiend and sent to authorities mocked the hapless police, glorifying in the lurid details of the crimes. It was the notorious From Hell letter that coined the spine-chilling nickname Jack the Ripper, by which the unknown killer became globally infamous. For over a century, Jack the Ripper's true identity remained one of crime's most baffling cold cases, despite countless suspects and theories ranging from Königsmorder to royalty. That all changed with explosive DNA evidence recently unveiled in the peer-reviewed Journal of Forensic Sciences. Through genetic analysis of a shawl recovered from the grisly crime scene near Catherine Eddowes, the Ripper's fourth victim, scientists say they have finally unmasked London's mythical bogeyman, Aaron Kosminski, a 23-year-old Polish immigrant barber and resident of Whitechapel who was a prime police suspect, even in 1888. Researchers extracted tantalizing traces of mitochondrial DNA from shawl stains believed to be the killer's semen and compared it to modern samples from living descendants of both Edoes and Kosminski. The genetic fingerprints aligned with a startling degree of certainty, identifying Kosminski as the likely source of the biological evidence left behind. These characteristics are surely not unique. The scientists admit of the DNA's indications the killer had brown hair and brown eyes, matching witness descriptions of a potential suspect near the Stride murder scene. But their compelling findings restart the 130-year-old murder mystery with a prime suspect in the crosshairs. Not everyone is convinced this finally closes the Ripper case, however. Skeptics argue the mitochondrial DNA evidence is far from conclusive since it can't necessarily prove Kosminski's guilt beyond reasonable doubt. Privacy issues also prevented the full genetic sequences from being published, undermining the scientific rigor of the analysis. Furthermore, doubts linger over whether the shawl definitively links back to the horrific Whitechapel crime scenes or could have been contaminated over the many decades since the murders. Past attempts to use cutting-edge forensic science to catch the Ripper, such as efforts by author Patricia Cornwell, have similarly sparked controversy over the accuracy of evidence analysis. While the latest investigation sheds dramatic new light on the Victorian slaughter that upended the richest city on Earth, history's most haunting whodunit may never be fully solved to the unanimous satisfaction of Ripper historians, scientists and amateur sleuths. The vapor-shrouded identity of Jack the Ripper continues to stalk a new age of forensic inquiry more than a century later. His malign mystique and unanswered question of motive appear destined to endure in the clutches of the night once more. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, the San Francisco Bay Area was gripped by fear as a serial killer, who became infamously known as the Zodiac Killer, unleashed a horrifying spree of murders and taunting letters. This enigmatic predator claimed to have killed at least 37 people, though authorities could only confirm five confirmed victims. The Zodiac's reign of terror began on December 20, 1968, when 17-year-old David Faraday and 16-year-old Betty Lou Jensen were shot dead while sitting in a parked car on Lake Herman Road in the city of Vallejo. By the time police arrived, Betty was already deceased, while David succumbed to his injuries on the way to the hospital. This grisly double homicide marked the Zodiac's inaugural strike. Only seven months later, on July 4, 1969, the killer struck again at the Blue Rock Springs Park, mere minutes from the previous crime scene. 
This time the victims were 22-year-old Darlene Farron and 19-year-old Michael Mago, who were ambushed in a parked car by the Zodiac brandishing a flashlight. While Farron lost her life, Mago miraculously survived, albeit with critical injuries. His description of the assailant, a young stocky white male with curly light brown hair and a large face, would become crucial in the investigation. Within an hour of the Blue Rock Springs attack, police received a chilling phone call from someone claiming responsibility for both the Lake Herman Road and Blue Rock Springs murders. The caller's identity remained unknown, but his haunting words marked the beginning of the Zodiac's psychological warfare against authorities and the public. On August 1, 1969, the San Francisco Chronicle, San Francisco Examiner, and Vallejo Herald newspapers each received handwritten letters from the self-proclaimed killer. These letters contained specific details about the murders, proving the writer's authenticity. Signed with a distinctive cross-circle symbol that would become the Zodiac's calling card, the letters also contained three cryptic codes that the killer demanded be published, threatening further bloodshed if his demands were not met. The codes were eventually cracked on August 8th by a couple in Salinas, California, revealing the Zodiac's chilling words. I like killing because it is so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all to kill. Something gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. The best part of it is that when I die, I will be reborn in paradise, and those I have killed will become my slaves. I will not give you my name because you will slow down or stop my collecting of slaves for the afterlife. As the Zodiac's body count grew, his taunting letters continued, sowing fear and unrest throughout Northern California. In his final communication on January 29, 1974, he ominously declared a new score, Me 37 SFPD 0, hinting at a staggering number of potential victims beyond the confirmed cases. Despite extensive investigations and countless leads, the true identity of the Zodiac Killer remains one of America's most baffling unsolved mysteries. His cunning, depravity, and obsession with cryptograms and codes have made him an enduring figure of fascination and dread in the annals of serial killer lore. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. On a fateful day in September 1982, the Chicago area was rocked by a series of shocking deaths that would forever change the way medications are packaged and consumed. Seven unsuspecting individuals, including 12-year-old Mary Kellerman, collapsed and died shortly after ingesting poisoned Tylenol pills laced with lethal doses of potassium cyanide. The victims were diverse in age and background. 27-year-old Mary Reiner, 31-year-old Mary McFarland, 35-year-old Paula Prince, 27-year-old Adam Janis, 25-year-old Stanley Janis, and 19-year-old Teresa Janis. The Janis family was particularly devastated, with Adam dying at the hospital, and Stanley and his wife Theresa succumbing to the poison after taking Tylenol to cope with their grief, resulting in three deaths in the same family on the same tragic day. As the bodies piled up, investigators like Cook County's Nick Pichos and Deputy Medical Examiner Edmund Donahue began connecting the dots. They noticed a striking similarity between the Tylenol bottles, a control number, MC-2880. Moreover, the bottles emitted a distinct almond-like odor, a telltale sign of cyanide poisoning. Blood tests confirmed the victims had ingested doses 100 to 1,000 times the lethal amount. In a stunning revelation, Donahue informed Johnson & Johnson, Tylenol's parent company, that their product had been intentionally tampered with and laced with potassium cyanide. The manufacturer swiftly issued a nationwide recall of over 31 million bottles, a move that cost them over $100 million, but potentially saved countless lives. The Tylenol poisonings didn't end there, however. Copycats emerged across the United States, prompting the introduction of tamper-resistant packaging and safety seals that have become standard practice today. Despite extensive investigations and a $100,000 reward offered by Johnson & Johnson, 
The perpetrator behind this heinous act remained elusive, and the case went cold. Decades later, in the late 2000s, the FBI's prime suspect emerged, James Lewis, a former employee of a firm contracted by the parent company. Special Agent Roy Lane, who had dedicated over 26 years to the FBI, was coaxed out of retirement to lead an undercover operation aimed at finally cracking the Tylenol murders case. Lane, now 75, expressed a bittersweet sentiment upon learning of Lewis's recent death at the age of 76 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. James Lewis' death ends a lifetime of cruelty to others and the compulsive need for revenge, Lane told The Independent. However, it also marked an unsatisfying end to the pursuit of justice he had dedicated half his life to. The Tylenol poisonings of 1982 remain one of the most chilling and perplexing unsolved crimes in American history. While the prime suspect has passed away, the mystery endures, serving as a grim reminder of the vulnerability of consumer products and the lengths to which some will go to inflict harm on innocent lives. As the shadows deepened and whispers of intrigue lingered in the air, one thing was certain, the next mystery was just around the corner, waiting to be unveiled. The mysterious tale of the Mary Celeste continues to captivate minds and fuel imaginations, even over a century after its fateful voyage. On December 4, 1872, this British-American ship was discovered adrift and deserted in the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean. What perplexed investigators was the ship's remarkable condition, seaworthy, cargo intact, but devoid of its crew. The only notable absence was a lifeboat, suggesting a deliberate and orderly evacuation. Yet the fate of those aboard, including Captain Benjamin Briggs, his family, and the seven crew members, remains an enigma as no communication or trace of them has ever been found. The Mary Celeste embarked on its journey from New York to Genoa, Italy in November 1872, under the command of Captain Briggs. On board were his wife, their two-year-old daughter, and a crew prepared for a six-month voyage. The ship was equipped not only for practicality, but also boasted luxurious amenities, such as a sewing machine and an upright piano, adding to the mystery of its abandonment. Historians and speculators alike have grappled with the puzzle of why a perfectly seaworthy vessel would be forsaken. Various theories have emerged over the years, from mutiny to pirate attacks, even fantastical notions involving sea monsters. Yet no conclusive evidence has ever surfaced to support any particular hypothesis. One particularly dramatic theory, put forth by Mr. Solly Flood, proposed that a violent mutiny occurred on board, resulting in the murder of Captain Briggs and his family. This theory relied on scant and circumstantial evidence, such as a bloody sword and alleged intentional damage to the ship's bow. However, closer examination suggests that these supposed clues may have been misinterpreted or staged by the salvage crew. The bloody sword likely was nothing more than a rusty or stained blade, while the damage to the bows could have been caused by routine maritime factors. In the absence of concrete evidence of violence or the remains of the captain's party, the most plausible explanation remains that some unforeseen emergency prompted the crew to abandon ship. While Mr. Solly Flood's theory adds a dramatic flair to the tale, it lacks substantial support from the available facts. The true fate of the Mary Celeste continues to elude us, wrapped in the shroud of maritime mystery that has fascinated generations. Despite over a century of speculation, the truth behind the abandoned ghost ship remains tantalizingly out of reach. Thank you for joining us on this exploration of the unexplained. We hope these mysteries have sparked your curiosity and encouraged you to delve deeper into the unknown. Until next time, stay curious, stay vigilant, and never stop seeking the truth.